Hello, colleagues. My name is Brian Coombs, and I'm a researcher in the Department of Urban and Rural Development at SLU. This presentation is part of the Siani webinar on de-agrarianization, and I will be talking about post-communist agrarian change in Ukraine and about different trends with respect to de-agrarianization on the one hand and re peasantization on the other. There are some clear tendencies towards de-agrarianization in Ukraine. With some of the largest farm corporations in the world, Ukraine, it can be said, is on the vanguard of agricultural corporatization, and I, and I will talk about the reasons and consequences of that. This is perhaps the most dominant trend today in Ukraine. However, there have also been some re-peasantization counter-tendencies. I'll mostly address corporatization in this presentation because this is what I have investigated most recently. I will, however, also address re-peasantization and rural livelihoods in general. Some background information on land reform in Ukraine. When Ukraine became independent in 1991, uh, there were some 11,000 collective and state farms, and there was the immediate question of what to do with them. From the perestroika era, there was considerable disappointment in the productivity of collective and state farms on the part of decision makers and a desire to institute cardinal reforms. In the mid-1990s, all state farms were converted to collective farms, and in 1999, following re-election, the then president issued a decree that broke up the collective farms and mandated that all collective farm workers would receive a parcel of land identified in nature and that they could lease out their parcel to whomever without the permission of the collective. This was followed up by a land code in 2002. Here, the sticky question was if farmland sales would be allowed. The intention was to allow sales, but this was so unpopular that in the end, the land code contained transitional, transitional provisions that instituted a moratorium on land sales until certain conditions were fulfilled. Uh, in theory, reformers, and international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF hoped that land sales would be allowed soon, but lifting the moratorium kept on getting delayed amid rancorous debate. Ukrainian farm fields are immense, so the fields were divided up by land reform like a chessboard with each beneficiary getting on average four hectares of land, though the actual size could vary depending on different factors. You can see a parcel map from a former collective farm on the right here, with the landscape as it is in 2018 on the left. So a field will have 10 to 20 individual owners, depending on how large the field is. Uh, the vast majority of landowners lease out their land to farm enterprises. There is another category of land uh, that the vast majority of landowners do actually cultivate, and that is land inside the settled portion of villages. You can see the village uh, at the bottom of the left-hand image here, but you cannot see the individual plots at this scale. Such small in-village plots range from hundreds of square meters to one or two hectares uh, in, this particular, in this particular village in which I have spent uh, some time. The land reforms 20 years ago are credited with launching an agricultural boom. The figure here shows production of major crops in Ukraine over the last 30 years, and you can see that production started to increase with the year 2000. Note there were major droughts in 2003, 2007, 2010, and 2012. But the benefits of this production boom are not going to rural areas. One reason is that farm enterprises are far more labor efficient. Much, much fewer people work in agriculture today compared to the Soviet period, and the result is depopulation of villages as people look for employment elsewhere. Also, lease rates, which should be a transfer from farm enterprises to landowners, are among the lowest in Europe. One reason for this is that there is a monopsony of farm enterprises. In many places, there's only one company that is leasing land from landowners, not giving landowners much choice or market power. I wanna say a few words about how the agrarian structure has changed in Ukraine following land reform. Ukraine has 45,000 registered farm enterprises today. The greater part of them are so-called individual farmers, which was a result of a separate reform inspired by the Western family farming model. However, these individual, individual farmers cultivate only about 10% of the farmland. In other words, the vast majority of Ukrainian farmland is cultivated by either joint stock companies or other forms of private enterprises. 
Uh, a word of caution about Ukrainian statistics is in order. Uh, in 2008, they were around 57,000 or so enterprises, and today they're 45,000. Some of this decrease reflects consolidation, no doubt. However, some of the numbers might have been inflated by some forms of corruption. Uh, uh, some of the enterprises might have been so-called dead souls, fictitious, enterprise, fictitious enterprises on the books. Uh, another important thing to mention here is that there are many private or individual farmers uh, who are not officially registered. Some were registered uh, individual farmers at one point, but they later deregistered their farms for tax reasons, while others were farmers who just never registered. They are referred to as odnesivniki, which is in Ukrainian means single person. These can be farms of say around 10 hectares in size and even larger. Uh, I in interviewed one such uh, person or farmer who deregistered his farm, but continued to cultivate his 300 hectares, uh, uh, a combination of land that he either he owned and he also leased. Um, and many of these farmers are off the radar screen in terms of government statistics. The next slide shows the aggregated amount of land cultivated by all the farms with one within different size categories. Uh, I have taken the size categories from Ukrainian statistics. This shows a shift towards farms of over 10,000 hectares in size. According to Ukrainian statistics, farms over 10,000 hectares in size cultivate today about 20% of Ukrainian farmland. Now again, a word of caution, there is a large amount of informal lease, so there are millions of hectares of land that are not reported on officially. My guess is that informal lease prevails more in the smaller farms and the larger farms, but I do not know that for sure. That being said, other sources confirmed, as seen in this image, a, a significant shift of farmland being used by very large farm corporations. I have studied a subset of farm enterprises in the region, corporations whose shares are listed on stock exchanges and publicly traded. This presentation here is primarily about Ukraine, but it in this earlier work that I've done, I've looked at public companies in both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, public companies have to release a lot of information about their operations and finances, and they tend to be somewhat more open to inquiries from the public. This has been my experience anyway. The number of public farm companies in the region has fluctuated over the years, but has generally gone down. Um, there are five public companies today whose chief revenues come from arable crop production, all of them in Ukraine. There are another five companies that are vertically integrated companies, meaning their chief revenues come from value-added lines of production, such as sunflower oil or sugar refining or meat production, put, who all, but who also have considerable territories under cultivation. The vertically integrated public companies are split between Russia and Ukraine. So there are not a lot of companies, but they have an outsized influence and are indicative of corporate farming in general in this region. Most of these companies are listed on the stock exchange in Western Europe, including Stockholm, while a few Russian companies are listed on the Moscow exchange. So I'm talking about these companies in the aggregate, and if anyone has any questions more specifically about uh, any company, that feel free to ask uh, when we have the webinar on, on May 5th. Uh, I chose not to go into specific details about, about specific companies. This figure shows net profit translated to US dollars of publicly traded companies whose main revenues come from arable uh, crop production in both Russia and Ukraine. These companies in particular were heralded as the future of farming with land banks of over 100,000 hectares uh, where they applied high-tech systems and international best practice. Despite the promise, some companies have disappointed investors. In particular, companies backed mainly by foreign investors have struggled. The foreign companies acquired large territories, but then found that agricultural operations became logistically difficult. Uh, the foreign investors are shown here in red. Two of these companies have since been delisted and sold to Russian companies at a considerable loss to investors. Uh, note that in 2013, uh, that was when food commodity prices took uh, uh, went down uh, drastically, uh, and that affected uh, the bottom line of many of these companies. And then 2014 and 15 uh, was a time of very intense uh, war between Ukraine and Russia, that war continues uh, today, uh, but not quite as intense as it was then. Uh, and uh, there were some drastic currency devaluations in both countries, and both of these things uh, affected these companies uh, in those years. 
But as you can see, uh, there are some successful stock listed farming companies whose main revenues come from arable farming. Uh, they're located in Ukraine where agricultural conditions are better. Uh, also, they're getting a little better you know, in recent years and, and they're becoming more profitable. There are also a number of large privately held farming corporations whose main revenues come from arable crop farming. Uh, uh, and you know, I visited these and they also appear to be, uh, I, I visited some of these and they also appear to be quite successful. Um, so despite some visible disappointments, corporate farming continues and is, is, is improving its performance. Uh, one thing to end this slide, uh, I, didn't, I don't show the performance of the vertically integrated companies, but they generally perform uh, much, much better. Uh, 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 their, their profit is a whole order of magnitude higher, a uh, hundred million dollars uh, or two hundred million dollars. So why this trend towards large farm corporations? Uh, there are several overlapping reasons. One reason is there was a kind of vacuum. Many people received a parcel of land, which I mentioned above, and there was some hope that these landowners would cultivate their own land. However, very few actually use their parcel uh, for a variety of reasons. It can be kilometers away and many, and, and many landowners don't have a car. Also to cultivate grains, you would need machinery and many landowners don't have the access to or the ability to purchase that. Uh, you could, in theory, cultivate a small scale garden out there, a vegetable garden, uh, but you would need water. Uh, it's warm and dry in the summer in Ukraine and there's not access to irrigation um, uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, and also there's the risk of someone stealing your produce while it's in the fields far from your house. This is a legacy of Soviet settlement policies with nucleated villages separated from the fields. Um, so a lot of obstacles in one way or another and, and uh, ultimately caused by lack of capital. Landowners didn't have access to capital and neither did the state. Um, Conducting the kind of mechanized arable farm operations that are suitable given the Ukrainian landscape and environment require, requires capital in the form of machines and knowledge. There's certainly a lot of knowledge in Ukrainian agriculture without a doubt. And there used to be a lot of adequate, perhaps inefficient, but still adequate Soviet equipment. But by the 2000s, the Soviet machine park was seriously degraded by lack of use and, lo and, by lack of use and looting. So agriculture needed access to finance to fund the acquisition of necessary machines. A lot of, in the end, a lot of the finance came from food processing oligarchs who expanded into primary agriculture. And some of the finance came from foreign investors. Uh, the Soviet legacy, uh, I argue, facilitated the corporate takeover. This step was re-landscaped in the 1950s and 60s to create an ideal landscape for large-scale agriculture. When it became legally possible to acquire land in Ukraine or Russia in the 2000s, the Soviet simplification of the landscape, which had been preserved to the present day, um, facilitated the acquisition of land on the part of investors. Uh, there was all this discourse about acquiring land, but really what most of the investors acquired is former is farms, former collective farms. Uh, we make this argument uh, in an article in 2016, it's in the reference list. And I'm working on some of the Soviet history of this in another article that's in preparation. And also Vogeler makes a similar argument uh, with respect to East Germany. So one of the questions that arises is what are the consequences of this corporatization? Uh, Hebink in his editorial in the Journal of Rural Studies referred to a kind of an, on, uh, to a continuing industrialization of agriculture as one trend that contributes to de-agrarianization with power shifting further up the value chain. Um, the Soviet context is a little special here because Soviet agriculture was also very industrialized uh, and they were experiencing serious environmental problems as a result of it. However, the 1990s and 2000s have meant a replacement of Soviet industrialization with Western green revolution technologies. This change occurred very quickly so Soviet industrialized farming practices were quite different, uh, but fundamentally compatible. Uh, and Soviet trained agronomists quickly adopted the suite of technologies in Western industrialized farming. Uh, this is a very interesting history 
I'm going to show some of the broad outlines now, but there's there's a detailed history has yet to be written, at, at least in English. This figure shows how cultivation on irrigated land has changed from the Soviet period. This is from a study I did in the most intensely irrigated area in southern Ukraine, and I have uh, verified this stats. You can see my study there. Uh, in the Soviet period, over half of irrigated land was devoted to feed crops, while today only a small fraction is devoted to feed crops, reflecting the post-Soviet collapse of livestock and, livestock and dairy farming. Technical and oil crops, meanwhile, are cultivated much more, and this is mainly sunflower, rapeseed, and soy. Soy is considered a technical crop in Ukrainian statistics. Uh, there's been a similar shift on dry land, but, but with somewhat less of an increase in oil and technical crops. Um, Livestock and, and dairy farming in the Soviet period were about domestic food security. So in broad terms, this is a significant shift towards cash crop production. There has also been a reduction in crop diversity and a simplification of crop rotations. This shows a field in southern Ukraine. You can see a large area in yellow, which is a rapeseed, and then fields of green, which is winter wheat. I was doing field work in this area in 2018, just a few weeks before this satellite image was taken. We spoke with the farm managers of the companies working this, these fields, uh, and their original intention apparently was to plant that whole area circled in red uh, to rapeseed, but they didn't manage in time, so they planted half of the area to winter wheat a little bit later. Uh, the area under the two circles here corresponds to the territory of a former state farm. I've seen the annual reports of the state farm in this area from the 1980s, and I can report that there was a more complex seven-year rotation on most of the fields, while the uh, the corporation that uses that land now has a four-crop rotation, <clears throat> uh, and there was a much greater diversity of crops planted uh, in the 1980s. Another thing to mention is that today, 17 people, including administrative personnel, work on the territory under the two circles. Uh, plus an additional 8,000 hectares in the surrounding area. In the Soviet period, there would have been thousands of workers on the same territory. Another important aspect of agriculture production in Ukraine today is the use of hybrid seeds. This chart here is from the USDA uh, and shows a relationship between increasing use of hybrid maize seeds uh, and increasing yield of maize. Another important aspect is the use of genetically modified seeds. There is a kind of uh, strange situation today where the use of GM seeds has been legal, but their import into Ukraine has been illegal. Uh, there are estimates, uh, however, that already 10 years ago, a significant amount of the sown area of soy was genetically modified seeds uh, and also less than soy, but also maize. A lot of maize was cultivated with uh, genetically modified seeds. Ukraine, with cheap labor and land, is a low-cost producer, and Ukrainian agricultural products are becoming more prominent on export markets. This figure shows the share of Ukrainian exports among all the exports for the crop shown. Ukraine today accounts for 20% of all maize exports, for example. Ukraine can compete on global markets on cost, which, contribute, which contributes to holding prices down and uh, putting the squeeze on farmers in other countries. So now I want to switch focus and talk about rural livelihoods and how Ukrainian peasants relate to corporations. I'm using the word peasant a little provocatively to refer to post-communist re-peasantization. Uh, it is also not uncommon to hear people in rural areas use the Russian or Ukrainian word for peasant to refer to themselves. The communist goal was to improve living standards so that there would be no more peasants defined as people who have to produce their own subsistence. Some progress was achieved on this front in the Soviet period, though ultimate success eluded Soviet planners and most collective farm workers were still forced to grow their own food to supplement meager salaries. Uh, in the post-communist period, however, with the liquidation of collective farms and collapse of employment in the agricultural sector, many people were forced to rely solely on their own means to ensure survival. This is what I mean by re and this is a cause of bitterness. Um, 
it's also, there's also considerable nostalgia for the late Soviet period, uh, because for many people, this was the period of highest material well-being. So above, I mentioned two kinds of land, land out in the fields and land inside villages. In the Soviet period, most households were given a plot of land inside villages, usually located next to the house. Uh, in the post-communist period, households were able to privatize these village plots. And today, rural households possess, uh, on average, 1.21 hectares of land that consists of these village plots, in addition to any land they may have received out in the fields when collective farms broke up, uh, thanks to land reform. So in villages with access to water, either groundwater or river water, uh, and you know, provided that these villages are not located too far from roads, uh, particularly major roads, these village plots, this one point, this on average 1.21 hectares inside villages is enough land to have profitable uh, production. Uh, this is mostly vegetable and fruit production. Um, another milk is another product that households have dominated in the post-communist era, though that dominance may be slowly decreasing. And here are some pictures I've taken of uh, smallholder production in, in villages in southern Ukraine um, of uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about trying to a lot of so a lot of this activity is in the informal sector. In fact, the vast majority of it is. Uh, but there's been a lot of talk in recent years about trying to bring some of this activity out of the shadows into the formal economy. Uh, and, uh, um, but the question is if, if that is even possible. So uh, the rural population is not actually overtly hostile towards agricultural corporations. Uh, there is perhaps a lot of indifference, but not inherent hostility. For many villagers, industrial pro production, industrial agricultural production is, is all they know. This is a quote from a, a, a focus group uh, that I was a part of in 2018. Uh, and this is a, uh, an elderly woman talking about, you know, kind of, the question is what the step means uh, she was answering the question of what the step means to her. Uh, and for her, the step is uh, industrial production, um, tractors and such. Um, it is also important to point out that uh, in many cases, corporate production, corporate agricultural production and household, smallholder, production don't compete with each other. They occupy different market niches with different end consumers in mind. And finally, another point I wanna mention is that uh, the peasants uh, are not always powerless in relation to corporations. Obviously, corporations have the upper hand, uh, but uh, in an interview with a privately held farming corporation outside Kiev, I was told how the corporation in question could not get rid of unprofitable milk production. They had leased land in a particular area and a condition of leasing the land was to retain dairy production that had been there earlier. They tried to improve the efficiency of the dairy production, but faced resistance from local staff and managers. The problem for the corporation was that the staff were the landowners. And if there was not going to be any milk production, then the company would not have access to the land. As the manager put it, no cows, no land. There has just been a major development, literally a month ago, which I saved for the end here. The Ukrainian parliament has just approved a proposal to finally allow farmland sales. This has been debated for 20 years with considerable rancor, and Ukraine has been urged by international financial institutions to allow farmland sales, but it has been deeply unpopular. Um, it was the kind of thing that on different occasions led to fisticuffs in the parliament, as in this image you see from February of this year. Uh, so if the population has mi may have mixed feelings about agricultural corporations, but they have consistently expressed their opposition to farmland sales. 
which can be seen in opinion poll after opinion poll. Roughly 70% of the population has expressed opposition to farmland sales. That being said, many people have said in farmland sales, and also uh, this was something that was expressed in that same focus group that I quoted earlier, that many people, even though they oppose it, would sell their land if it was possible. Um, the big corporations, ironically, have not been driving this. At least publicly, they have adopted a very neutral stance, particularly in recent years. Um, uh, part of the speculation is that many are content with cheap long-term lease of land and are not necessarily thrilled with the prospects of having to uh, invest a lot of capital uh, to, uh, to acquire land that they already control. Um, I once asked a Swedish manager with operations in Ukraine what they would do if it became possible to buy land in Ukraine. This was several years ago. And he jokingly said, we'll make them an offer that they can't refuse. <clears throat> the current proposal that just got approved does not allow foreign ownership of farmland. It does, however, allow corporate ownership, but only Ukrainian companies. But the problem is, if some of the agro giants uh, make offers that people, so to say, can't refuse. Um, so the current proposal, or the proposal that was approved, does not allow uh, foreign ownership of Ukrainian agricultural land, but the webs of finance connecting Ukrainian oligarchs and Western, uh, and Western finance can be difficult to untangle. So this, this has literally just happened, and it's not going to be implemented until next summer, uh, to, uh, July 2021. And so uh, uh, it is difficult to predict the consequences of this, and it's probably going to take a number of years for these consequences to actually unfold. To conclude this presentation, um, There's no indication that corporate farms are about to give way to something else. Uh, corporate farming is, uh, is uh, the future of Ukrainian farming. Um, another conclusion is that in unexpected and perhaps ironic ways, the collective farm experience paved the way for corporatization of Ukrainian agriculture and the way that farming is conducted today. Uh, villagers, peasants, smallholders can thrive uh, given a certain conditions, uh, uh, but the question is if they can survive uh, in the formal economy. Um, uh, and then finally, the big question, uh, which no one knows the answer to, is what effect will farmland sales have both on the corporations, on corporate agriculture, and on uh, rural livelihoods. So uh, thank you for listening uh, and I look forward to your questions.